I think there's something to be said about re-experiencing a video game in a brand new way that either revitalizes your passion in it or instills a new one. Most commonly, this can occur after replaying a game for the first time in years, accompanied by a fresh perspective. Less commonly than that is by changing the way you play, perhaps through unconventional means. But maybe the least common of all is by completely flipping your opinion not through persuasion or discussion, but by simply watching someone else play it. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time is that game for me. With a legacy almost as old as the industry itself, one might argue it's the most important game of its generation. But for just as long, I failed to connect with it in the same way countless others have, looking towards the more unique entries in the Zelda series for that connection and inspiration. Criticisms aside, I always felt it was a great game, a must-play even, but for reasons similar to my initial apathy towards Super Mario 64, a game I'd now consider one of my all-time favorites, I failed to see it for what it was past its impact at the time of its release. That all changed in 2017. In the pits of one of the darkest periods of my life, I desperately sought out something to cling to, to remind myself what it was like to be secure and happy. Instead of something new, I craved something familiar, something comforting. It was during that moment I was introduced to exactly what I needed, a live stream hosted by the most charming streamer on Twitch, Clint Second Place Stevens. To understand why I failed to value Ocarina of Time as highly as its siblings, we've got to dig deep into the past. Growing up during the late stages of the Nintendo 64's life cycle, you'd think Ocarina would have been my introduction to the series. However, my first Legend of Zelda game was actually Majora's Mask. I don't think there's another game that instilled so many vivid memories in me so early on in my life. I was a timid child, prone to feeling extremely uncomfortable when exposed to unsettling imagery in games. And that's exactly what Majora's Mask is. From the moon's face in the opening, to Link's hallucinogenic transformation into the Deku Scrub, to the maniacal frustration of the Happy Mask salesman, there was something waiting to scare me around every corner, making the game difficult to play. I was even too young to really understand what the objective was, failing to complete the opening sequence in Clocktown on my own. That being said, I couldn't stop playing, running around Clocktown aimlessly in an attempt to gain some sort of progress in that three day window before being inevitably obliterated from existence. And for whatever reason, it was fun. This is what The Legend of Zelda was to me. My family never owned A Link to the Past or Ocarina of Time, despite owning both of the consoles they were played on. It wasn't until the moment my family acquired a copy of the Master Quest release on GameCube that I had my first experience with Ocarina, and this wasn't a conventional one. I was still too young and inexperienced to make significant progress in a Zelda game, but what I could do was watch my brother play. He shared a joint save file with one of his best friends at the time. Every time that friend came over to our house, they played and I sat down to watch. It's hard for me to recall many of my childhood memories because of just how hazy that time of my life is, but in the process of trying to understand what Ocarina of Time means to me, I could think of nothing else other than those moments the three of us shared on that couch. I did eventually go on to complete Ocarina of Time on my own in an attempt to finish all the Zelda games I started as a child, and while I loved it from front to back, it failed to leave the same lasting impression I had after completing Majora's Mask, Wind Waker, and Twilight Princess. Each of those games felt like a deviation from Ocarina of Time in their own unique and special ways. The team behind Majora's Mask must have completely rethought what a Zelda game could be by focusing on side stories and atmosphere, turning what easily could have been a rushed asset flip into a cult classic. And Wind Waker introduced a more explorable world with characters you're able to really empathize with. Even Twilight Princess, an entry one could argue is a more faithful reimagining of Ocarina of Time, explores darker themes, introduces an enthralling new villain, and expands heavily on its world switching mechanic. And this all left Ocarina itself feeling unremarkable. I held this belief for years, reaffirmed by the endless waves of criticism, only one of the most important video games ever was doomed to face. And even when my brother and I tried to recreate that initial experience, we struggled to reach further than the first dungeon. 
Now let's fast forward a bit to the aforementioned year of 2017. If you're familiar with my channel, you'll understand how important yet dark this year was to me. I was lost. I had just finished my two-year college degree, an agonizing process from start to finish, and I had no plans to continue my education. I had long since given up on my initial dream of becoming a YouTuber, consumed by imposter syndrome and a toxic approach to creation. And finally, I had just been laid off from the only job I'd ever had, one that I worked at for four years. With not a clue of what to do next, I turned to the one thing I had grown to love during such a tumultuous year, and that was my stream, filling the creative void that was left when I decided to move on from YouTube. It felt like the stars had finally aligned to allow me to pursue a passion unburdened from the distractions of school and work, and for a while, I really enjoyed it. That was until the growth began to plateau and I struggled to find the correct niche for my content. Almost as quickly as I started, I was burnt out to the point where I just had to stop. Yet giving up on my stream hurt harder than any of my viewers could understand. Ever since I finished high school, my goal to become a full-time content creator was what got me out of bed in the morning. And when I failed to achieve that goal, I had convinced myself that it was because I didn't dedicate enough time to it between my work and education. When streaming failed, there was nothing left to blame but myself. And with nothing to take its place after giving up, I was thrust into an identity crisis with no purpose and nowhere to go. Without going into too much detail, there was something incredibly harrowing about that experience. Because no amount of knowledge or good parenting could prepare me for what I had to confront in my own mind. The compounding pressure to succeed left me feeling completely disconnected from the kid that grew up well off enough, did well in school, and excelled at what he wanted to put his mind to. It wasn't supposed to be like this. I wanted to go back. To be that child that believed that everything would eventually work itself out as long as he continued to trudge along. In an attempt to re-establish that connection, I indulged in old games and hobbies I was once passionate in, but I still felt alone. That was when my brother introduced me to something that would help. Something new, yet strangely familiar. It didn't change my life, but it provided me with enough temporary relief to get back on my feet again. And that was Clint Stevens speedrunning what else but The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. While I'd spent the last few months busy with my own stream, I'll admit I was pretty ignorant to the wider culture of Twitch. My belief was that watching a streamer with a large audience and an endless sea of chat messages to get lost in was a waste of time, because my interest in watching someone else's stream hinged on the ability to interact with them through chat. If the streamer would never see my message, what was the point? Because of this, I began watching Clint's stream for the first time, expecting to quickly lose interest before closing the window. But for some reason, I kept watching. Something about this felt different. In reality, the way Clint handled his stream crushed every expectation I had for a typical big streamer. It appeared as though the vibe of his stream had not changed from when he only had a handful of people watching him up until this very moment with 2,000 live viewers. There was no fancy overlay, green screen, or flashy alerts. Just gameplay, speedrun splits, and a scuffed webcam with only the light of his CRT TV illuminating his face in a dark echoey room while he played. As I continued to watch, specific aspects of the stream his viewers would joke about became more and more familiar. The red chair, the mint hoodie, the flannel shirts, the dampe sacrifices, the GDQ and height jokes. And Clint was an absolute beast at speedrunning Ocarina of Time. This wasn't the first time I had been drawn to speedrunning, but it opened my eyes to the appeal of watching someone stream their run attempts live. It wasn't really about being there during the final minutes of a PB attempt, but to enjoy each subsequent attempt for what it was. Another excuse to visit all the locales of Hyrule while listening to funny stories and chat messages over the sounds of the game. The run itself was something to behold. When most people think of speedrunning, the tricks that allow players to outright skip large portions of the game probably come to mind. In the case of Ocarina, this meant wrong warping from the very first boss fight to the final sequence of the game. But for Clint, this wasn't enough. In surely what was born from a deep love for the game in all of its aspects, his choice of playstyle was a 100% completion run, collecting every item, visiting every location, and defeating every boss. 
it felt more beholden to the vision of the entire game. There were even elements of the run that still stick out in my brain because of how they affected the mood of the chat and stream. Chicken spam, yoloing through guards, clutching wrong warps, ice cavern spamming, fishing, dampe, insane spear temple tricks, that one long shot trick in the fire temple that made everyone spam Clint Sharpshooter Stevens, and who could forget choking and collapse at 5 o'clock in the morning. There were narratives in place that served the live aspect. Clint was notorious for choking runs, forever playing second fiddle to the world record holder, ZFG. But he rarely took this endeavor too seriously, laughing off his mistakes where someone else might break their controller. But best of all, while he was incredibly dedicated to improving his skill, the stream uniquely wasn't defined by that. With large amounts of downtime allowing the speedrun to serve as a backdrop for talking about whatever was on his mind, he rarely over-explained things or shifted focus from the stream to the run, as opposed to most other speedrunners. And this was what made the stream so appealing to stick around in for long periods of time. He was just charming and fun, bouncing off of chat memes and discussions effortlessly. It also definitely helped that Clint streamed during the graveyard shift, late into the night. As someone who struggles to fall asleep without listening to music or a YouTube video, I found listening to the chill vibes of the stream and Clint's infectious laugh over the relaxing sounds of the game to be incredibly comforting. I often didn't make it to the end of the stream, but that didn't matter, because during a time where I couldn't be left alone in silence to deal with the negative thoughts in my mind, I now had the stream to soothe me to sleep. I think a lot of his regular viewers could relate to these feelings too. One could argue that these aspects could be served just as well from a let's play on YouTube of Ocarina of Time, but the speedrun and live aspects brought more comfort, tradition, and familiarity. After a bad day, I knew that when I laid down to rest, Clint would be there, acting as my escape for what I dealt with in my day-to-day -day life. Even in the event that the stream had me too invested to go to sleep, I didn't mind because I had begun to feel like part of the community. If there was good RNG during Dampe, the iconic make or break portion of the run, you'd bet I'd be awake until Clint PB'd or the run died. And to be fair, there were definitely a few too many nights where I stayed awake until the hours of 4 or 5 in the morning watching the stream. Back then, I knew this wasn't healthy for me, but I didn't really care because at the very least, I had begun to embrace this dysfunctional period of my life for what it was, trying to make the most of it by doing what provided me relief. There was something reassuring about watching the stream alongside a wealth of people who weren't all too similar in our day-to-day -day lives, but at night, we were all one and the same. There was a culture to Clint's streams. So much so that a viewer like me, who originally saw no purpose in sending chat messages in a stream where I knew the streamer wouldn't notice them 99% of the time, could somehow become engaged and enjoy feeling like part of the collective. So much so that I even joined his Discord community, making a group of online friends within it. This was short-lived, as Clint's streams seemed to act more as a refuge for nocturnal degenerates than a place to craft long-standing relationships. But if I could say one thing to them, it would be thank you for chatting late into the night about nothing or keeping me company while I sat in my car on a cold early March morning waiting to get my Nintendo Switch at launch. When I had seemingly nothing, Clint's stream helped by allowing me to feel like a part of something. And from there, I was able to slowly start building myself back up again. As a viewer, you weren't really meant to stay in Clint's stream forever. And he did his part to remind you of that, something I took to heart. I think it goes to show just how genuine he really is as a streamer. Take one look at his Twitch page nowadays and you might understand what I mean. He quit speedrunning Ocarina of Time years ago. And ever since then, the promise of a stream every night has become a distant memory, a meme in his community. But that's because Clint only streams with a purpose. For a long time after Ocarina, it was to master something new in the form of Super Mario 64. Those streams played a huge part in inspiring me to speedrun Super Mario 64 myself. After Mario, it was simply to enjoy the hot multiplayer games of the time with fellow streamers who enjoyed his stream about as much as his viewers did. And after that, it was to assert dominance over Forsen and Moon Moon in both Minecraft speedrunning and Tony Hawk Pro Skater respectfully. I'm sure there are countless others who can tie their nostalgic roots with Clint's stream back to these portions. 
But for me, the Ocarina of Time era was particularly special, and now I understand why. In a moment where I felt completely disconnected from the person I once was, looking back at the past with nostalgia and a longing to return, Clint's stream allowed me to go back in time just for a little bit, because watching him play for hours while casually shooting the shit with his chat felt just like sitting on the couch with my brother again watching him play through Ocarina. This is what makes Ocarina special to me. Each Zelda game I listed earlier has impacted me during different stages of my life. Majora's Mask was my first. Wind Waker was my first fully realized Zelda experience. And Twilight Princess kept me company when I came down with the chicken pox and the flu back to back. That was the best worst two weeks ever. But Ocarina? Ocarina was there for me when I needed it the most. To me, Ocarina embodies Zelda. It's not my favorite to play, as that might go to Wind Waker or Majora's Mask, depending on how I'm feeling, and I don't think it's the best in the series, a quality I'd attribute to A Link Between Worlds. But to me, it's seemingly the most important Zelda game. I think it's safe to say that all roads eventually lead back to The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. It set the tone for gameplay, storytelling, and atmosphere in 3D Zelda games, as well as establishing a cycle of tradition, revisiting thematic elements introduced by A Link to the Past that makes Zelda as a whole the iconic franchise it is, as well as being an incredible game in its own right. But this is only as much of a video about Ocarina of Time as it is about Clint Stevens, because he is the one that made it special for his dedicated viewers, much like my brother did for me all those years ago. I wanted to briefly touch on his prolonged absences from Twitch not to shame him or mope about the good times long since past, but to highlight just how authentic he really is as a streamer. He is an incredibly rare breed on Twitch, returning from these long absences with sometimes more average viewers than he had before. Because when he does return, it feels like reconnecting with that one friend that you can talk to for the first time in months and just pick up right where you left off. Clint doesn't chase trends. He just logs on and does whatever the fuck he wants, whether it's playing a few rounds of Mario Kart or completing Winnie the Pooh's home run derby after an unspeakable amount of attempts. That one was something to behold. I would love to see Clint return to regular streaming just as much as the next person, but I'm also okay with the idea of him doing whatever he wants to do away from Twitch, because he's already given so much to me. So to Clint, thank you for inspiring me to appreciate Ocarina of Time in a brand new way. Thank you for creating a space where I could feel like I had something instead of nothing. And thank you for persistently reminding me of those cherished childhood memories spent with my big brother, my best friend. This isn't a goodbye in the literal sense, but more so an acknowledgement of the fact that I've become more than the person that entered your stream for the first time, lost and confused about what to do next. All that being said, whenever you do feel like revisiting the stream, I'll probably be there, lurking while occasionally posting some smiles or lol w's. Wizard what? Wizard what?